Good afternoon. Um, first things first, there seems to be a problem with the uh, audio. I want you how to hear the microphone. No. The microphone doesn't work, and my microphone doesn't work. Uh, maybe it works through this speaker, but um, I'll just have to um, project uh, and hope you can hear me. Raise your hand if I start speaking too, slow, too uh, softly. Uh, I'll keep the microphone on just in case the uh, actual recording does work. If it doesn't, then the video recording on YouTube is going to have some crappy audio from my laptop or from the camera. Um, but we'll have to make do, and I'll, I'll make a, a, a I'll send a, send a note to the agency to uh, hope you fix it by next week. Uh, but let's uh, let's just uh, do it the old-fashioned way. Um, further admin. Before we get started with the lecture, uh, if you haven't joined a group yet, like project group, and you still need to do the project this uh, this time, if you haven't done, if you don't have a great for the project yet, um, then join a project group now. Don't worry too much about finding a good fit or, or uh, negotiating a group on the discussion board. Just pick a group that doesn't have five members yet and join at random, and uh, Flip side of that is, if your group doesn't have five members yet, expect the possibility that somebody will join who you don't know, who you haven't talked to yet. Uh, so from both sides, that might be a little awkward. Just make, yeah, just uh, do your best to make it work. So if you're joining a group that you haven't talked to yet, uh, what I recommend, well, accept the fact that people probably already have a plan. So just go along with whatever the plan is and make yourself useful. To say, you know, what can I do? I talked to a few people who didn't have a group yet, who were sort of having some scheduling problems and couldn't attend uh, project meetings, and that's why they had difficulty joining a group because they couldn't, you know, make these promises. Uh, just try and work it out. If somebody joins your group, just try and think of something they can do. Uh, do some literature research, do some programming, make some nice plot from the data sets, something like that. And if they can't join project meetings, just make them do something. Right? You're all adults. I'm sure you can make it work out. Uh, if you haven't figured out yet where the work groups are and where the uh, project meetings are, there's a page called Schedule Details. Click on that link and you'll find uh, where you're supposed to be and when you're supposed to be there. So let's start. I'm going to talk probability today, which is a, a fun subject and a very useful subject. But it's also a subject that comes with a lot of, um, well, that comes with a lot of baggage in terms of how it's defined mathematically. Uh, the basic principles aren't that difficult, but it takes a while to convey them very to con convey them with enough accuracy. Uh, so I'll do my best to go through the preliminaries first, and to just um, I, I hope most of you will have had some probability theory already. If not, there are some links on the compass page. Um, so I'll just go through the basics again today to hopefully, hopefully refresh your memories. If you're seeing these things for the first time, you may have to uh, do a little extra work after the lecture to catch up properly. So that's step one, the basics of probability. Then we'll need to discuss a little bit of information theory which I guess most of you won't have seen yet. It's a kind of branch of probability theory or something very related to probability theory, um, which comes up a lot in machine learning. It's very useful, a particular way of thinking about probability that's very useful in machine learning. And then after the break, we are going to have a look at how do we use these concepts to build actual machine learning models. Specifically this week, we're going to just talk about classification. How do we use probability to do classification? Uh, we'll start with looking at some Bayesian classifiers. And we'll finish up with something called cross-entropy loss. If you remember, uh, two weeks ago we talked about 
linear classifiers and why uh, well, we introduced this first uh, classification loss, the least squares loss, which wasn't very good. And I promised you we were going to talk later about loss functions that were very good. And this is one of those. This is the first one of those. The other one of those will uh, be on surface. So let's get started. Um, and before we dig into the mathematics of probability, let's talk a little bit first about what probability actually means, what we say, uh, also what we mean when we say the word probability. So uh, here's a little example. This is an article in the Guardian. So let's say you read this article in the Guardian, one of eight European teenage boys gamble online. And let's imagine you, uh, you're a parent, you have a son, a teenage son, and you say to your partner, well, look at this headline. This means that the probability that our son is gambling online is one in eight. And your partner says, well, that's ridiculous. Firstly, he's definitely not gambling online because he's using a credit card and we know he doesn't have a credit card. So you go, well, okay, sorry, well, uh, maybe not our son, but then let's say his best friend, Josh. This means, this headline means that the probability that Josh is gambling is one in eight. And your partner on a more philosophical level does well, now that still doesn't make any sense because Josh either is gambling or he isn't gambling. There's no probability about it. It's true or it's not true. Uh, so who's right? Well, who's right depends on what you mean when you say probability. And there are two basic, yeah, basically the word probability is ambiguous. And there are two ways of uh, defining it which are uh, which don't mean the same thing. So we'll look first at uh, objective probability, which basically says probability is an objective value. Whatever we mean by it, uh, you can't have a different probability than I do. So if I say uh, the probability of a die landing, uh, uh, landing on one, a die is a, a double state, a dice, uh, a die landing on a one, then you have to have the same probability as I do. If we both understand everything properly, we cannot disagree about what a probability is, unless one of us misunderstands. That's objective probability. It's like a property of the universe. And the most uh, common the most common objective definition of probability is called frequentism, which defines probability as uh, uh, a characteristic number defined by repeated experiments. So if I talk about the probability of rolling a die, then what I'm actually saying, if I'm saying the probability of the one is one in six, is that if I roll the die lots and lots of times, I'm telling up the number of sixes, and I divide it by the total number of throws, then that proportion will converge to one in six with the number of throws. So it's a property of a repeated experiment. So if you want to talk about uh, probability in the frequentist uh, sense, you really need to, if you want to define it properly, you need to define what the experiment is that you're going to hypothetically repeat. You don't have to actually do the experiment, but it has, there has to be this hypothetical experiment. That's frequentism. And under frequentism, uh, your partner's right. Under frequentism, either your son is gambling or isn't gambling. Either your son is gambling or isn't gambling. And there's no way to do a repeated experiment uh, Let's say either your son or Josh, like Mr. Josh, we ended up with. So there's no way to repeat an experiment where one time, one run of the experiment, Josh is gambling, and one run of the experiment, he isn't gambling. So there's no objective probability whether or not Josh is gambling. It's just some truth that we happen to not know. What you can say is there's an experiment you can do where you pick a random European boy, uh, it's between 10 and 20, and you see whether they are gambling. And you can do that again for another random boy and for another random boy and so on and so on. That's a repeated experiment and that will give you a different outcome every time. So that's a frequency and that's probably how they actually came up with this number. Uh, so the probability that a random uh, European teenage boy is gambling is 1 in 8. That's fine. But a specific random teenage boy doesn't matter under frequentist probability. However, there is also subjective probability. And subjective probability states that probability is merely an expression of my beliefs. So when I say uh, 
when I roll a die, the probability that what uh, that <coughs> that it will land on six is one on six. It means that I am uncertain about what the die is going to land on, and I am uh, quantifying that uncertainty with an eye. So it's an expression of my belief. And Bayesianism <laughs> is the, uh, which we'll look at a little bit more, why it's called Bayesianism and what that means. Uh, but this is the prime uh, prime form of uh, objective probability. It's objective probability, sorry. Uh, and under Bayesianism, uh, we're right, and our partner is wrong. Under Bayesianism, we can say the probability that Josh is gambling is one in eight. But we can also say the probability that our son is gambling is one in a hundred. Because we know more about our son. We know that he's probably not gambling because we know he doesn't have a credit card and we know uh, what he's doing online and he has strong filters, maybe something like that. So, uh, and uh, I can have a different uh, probability for this event that our son is gambling than my partner. These probabilities can differ because it's a subjective measure. Uh, so note that um, that uh, uh, one, in some sense, encompasses the other. So if I'm if I have proper beliefs about the outcome of an experiment, like rolling a die, then those probabilities, my beliefs about the outcome of the experiment, if I understand it properly, will coincide with the frequentist probability. So in that sense, the probabilities will be the same. There will be no disagreement. And it only enters into this phase where we do this. There's only a disagreement when you start talking about the probability of things that are uh, determined but unknown. And that's where subjective probability still makes sense, but objective probability doesn't. So I mean, you don't have to be one or the other. You don't have to pick a camp, although there are camps. And that's a, a lot of disagreement between Bayesians and frequentists. You don't have to be one or the other, and you can just, when you want to be absolutely precise about what you mean when you talk about probability, you can just uh, say, well, in this case, I'm using the subjective or the objective sense of probability. Um, but it leads to very different ways of doing statistics, which we'll see later. And it also leads to the question of what is machine learning? How, where does machine learning fit in? Is machine learning a, when we use probability machine learning, do we use it in a Bayesian way or do we use it in a frequentist way? Basically, my answer to that would be that machine learning has its own fundamentals, has its own fundamental principle. I would say that machine learning is not fundamentally a probabilistic discipline, which is more of a personal, uh, other machine learning researchers might disagree. Uh, but I would say that the basic thing we try to do in machine learning, at least in offline machine learning, is minimize the loss on the test set based on only seeing the training set. And you can interpret these as probabilistically drawn data sets, which is a very useful thing to do and it works very well. You don't have to. It's not necessary. So you can bring probability into it, and we're going to do that today, and it's going to uh, pay off a lot. But you don't have to do machine learning in a probabilistic way. We sort of just mix and match and pick and choose and whatever works, works for us. So we don't have to worry that much about whether we're Bayesians or frequentists. Which means we can move on to the basics of probability theory, which is a very different, um, well, a very different but slightly different <laughs> discipline from statistics. Statistics is applying probability to the real world. Probability theory is just the mathematical framework, the mathematical structures we use to describe what probability is in a mathematical sense. And it's built up on these four basic ingredients, the sample space, the event space, a probability function phi, and the idea of a random variable. So let's go through those very quickly. Basically, when we talk about the probability, we talk about either the outcome of some experiment or some fundamental thing that is true, whether we're, depending on whether we're uh, being objectivists or being subjectivists. So for now, let's stick with a, uh, an experiment. And let's start with some basic examples. So an experiment might be flipping a coin, or rolling a die, or rolling two die, dice, uh, together or one after the, after the other. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Some experiment is going to happen, and one of many things is going to be the outcome. 
and that set of many things, that many possible, those many possible things, that's called the sample space. And one of those things in the sample space is going to happen. Sometimes the sample space is discrete, which are like uh, the example of a die, which means that between any two outcomes in the sample space, there is not another outcome. There is no third outcome between heads and tails. It's either one or the other. And sometimes the sample space is confused. Like if we sample a random person from a population and measure their height, then it's easier to say that that is a continuous value. So between the height 1.7 meters and 1.8 meters, there are essentially an infinity of values between those, uh, between those values up to physical uh, measurement uh, accuracy, but let's not get into the details. Basically, it's best to think of that as a continuous value. And then from the sample space, we build the event space. And the event space is basically the set of subsets of the sample space. So an event is not necessarily a single thing that can happen, but a collection of things that can happen. For instance, if I roll a die, I can throw a number higher than three or lower than three. Or I can roll an even number or an odd number. Or I can roll a number in the set one, three, six. Oh, that's an odd number. I can roll a number in the set one, two, or six, or not in set one, two, or six. And all of these are events. And all of these also have probabilities. It's not just the uh, atomic elements in the sample space that have probabilities, but the events also have probabilities. And we also want to talk about those probabilities. So if we have a discrete sample space, it's very simple. We just take the power set, set of all subsets. The power set of the sample set space is the event space. And if we have a continuous sample space, things get a little bit more difficult. Uh, we have to construct something called a sigma algebra. It doesn't really matter. Just This is sort of a pretty decent abstraction, so you can just trust that that works. <coughs> and if you won't trust that, then you have to get into measure theory, which is very complicated. So let's not go there. Uh, so those are called events. And the probability function, which I don't have a second slide for, that I talked earlier, is function p assigns probabilities to events. And to help us talk about events, about the probabilities of events, we also use random variables. Uh, random variables, I will deliberate a little bit about where, how deep I should go into the definition of random variables. They have a very weird definition which is very far removed from how they're actually used. So I'm going to describe how they're used in, uh, intuitively without defining them properly. Uh, with my apologies, because otherwise it would just take too long. Basically, a random variable is a way to describe events. And we say something like the random variable D is uh, a letter that takes certain values, like the values in the event space. So D takes the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then we can say things like the probability that D is 4, the probability that D is larger than 3, or D is even. So basically, it's just a sort of language to help us describe these events, and these events then have probabilities attached. <coughs> and common uh, random variables, if you're going to see when we talk about machine learning, are uh, the features of a random instance. So the ith feature of random instance of uh, random instance j, we might indicate with this kind of letter. The class of a randomly chosen instance, we might in case of this letter. So a data set is a sequence, in, uh, if you model it probabilistically, is a sequence of n random variables from 1 to j, uh, so from 1 to n indexed by j. And random variable, uh, sorry, random instance j will have class yj. So every single instance in our data set is an instantiation of a random variable. That's usually how we think about it. And we can also talk about models being selected at random. And then it might look like that. Uh, we'll see some examples. If it doesn't make sense yet, we'll see some examples of what this looks like in practice. So we can say something like the probability that x is 0 is the probability that x takes the value uh, 0. And then this thing here represents a number between 0 and 1. It represents a probability, right? If we don't put a 0 here, but an x, 
then this thing here becomes a function of x. This doesn't represent a single number because we haven't instantiated x. x is a variable, not a random variable, a plain old-fashioned variable. So now we have a function of x, which is the probability that the random variable x takes this value. Uh, so the whole function might look something like this. If x is 0, the probability is 3 And if x is 1, the probability is 3 quarters. Which gets a little uh, verbose if you use this kind of equals uh, notation all the time. So we can use two kinds of shorthands. We can either, if we uh, don't care about precisely indicating what the function is over, we can just refer to the function by its uh, random variable. Or if we know for the value x to which random variable it's supposed to correspond, then we can just refer to it as p of small x. And both of these are basically shorthand for the situation where the random variable capital X takes the value small x. And it all, it will look pretty intuitively once you start getting into it, but uh, if you get into trouble with look back to this slide, this is what it all stands for. So those are the basic ingredients of probability. Now let's have a look at what kind of um, probability distribution, what kind of concepts we can describe using these ingredients. And I'll go through the, uh, the most important ones very quickly. Uh, so let's start with the, let's say we have an event space, or sample space, described by two random variables, x and y. So we do some experiments, and at the end of that experiment, the random variables x and y will both take some value, which we've described what that possible value could be. And we'll also talk about the probability and the outcomes of those experiments. So we can talk about these kinds of uh, probability distributions, the joint and marginal conditional probability, and then there's some additional concepts I'd like to talk about. But let's start with the joint distribution. Uh, and we'll use this as a running example, a very simple running example. We take a random person from the population, and we measure these two things. We measure their age, which we'll uh, measure as a categorical variable, so they're either young, a teenager, or old. And we measure the state of their teeth. So their teeth are either healthy, unhealthy, or sick. Just a slightly contrived example to, uh, to show you how this works. So the uh, joint probability of these two random variables might look something like this. It's just the probability that the h random variable takes some value and the probability that the, uh, sorry, the probability that both the h takes one value and the uh, t takes another value. Uh, which gives us uh, nine possibilities for nine possible outcomes for which we need to determine probability. So we can just write that down in the table. Uh, so that might look something like this. So this here, the top one, represents one number. In this case, the number O H one over A T. And the bottom one represents a function, which is entirely described by this table. So that's what we call the joint probability. Now, if you're only interested in one of these uh, values, do I have an echo suddenly? Well, oh, never mind. Uh, sorry, something weird. Oh, uh, I'll stand over here. I don't think I have an echo over here. Um, if you're only interested in one of the probability for one of these random values, let's say you're only interested in one of the probability that somebody is young then you can do something called marginalizing out. So you compute the margins of your joint probability, the sum of the values, and these give you a probability distribution over just a single, uh, a single value. So here you can marginalize out over all the possible values of the t random variable. So this gives you the probability that somebody is old, irrespective of the probability. <coughs> That's called the marginal probability. Uh, so it looks like this symbolically. I'll uh, skip the class as quickly for now to focus on the conditional probability. So in some cases, instead of uh, not caring about one of the variables, you might say something like, what if I know 
one of those. So instead of sampling from the whole population, I'm going to sample from the population of young people. And then I want a distribution over the stage of their teeth. So essentially what you're doing, imagine you're throwing darts at this table. You're essentially throwing your darts only at the top row. And then you want to normalize the probability for only the top row. So what you're doing is you're picking this value, but you divide it by the sum over this row. And that gives you the probability that somebody has false teeth, given that they're young. So you can write that down like this. So it's the um, joint probability of f and y divided by the marginal probability of y. Or more symbolically, the joint probability of x and y divided by the sum over all possible uh, value of x. So look at this. This is the definition of conditional probability. Uh, if you rewrite this, so you just take uh, this element to the, uh, uh, so you just take the joint to the left and the conditional to the right, you get this. So it's just flipping the factors around. And this is something I want to show you specifically. I recommend you memorize this carefully because this um, rewriting joint probability, decomposing it into conditional times the marginal, is going to come up a lot. So this pattern, sort of try and imprint this as much as possible because this is going to come back a lot. It's very important. And it just follows directly from the definition of conditional probability. <coughs> Uh, so that's all for categoric for this um, discrete sample spaces. You can also use it for um, uh, continuous uh, uh, sample spaces and look something like this. So here we have the joint probability of a continuous x and a continuous y. In this case, a multivariate normal distribution, which we, we've already seen a few times. Um, and if you do something like marginalizing, basically what you're doing is you're projecting and you're summing over one of these values, so you're projecting onto one dimension, and it becomes a univariate normal distribution. And if you're doing something like taking a conditional, you're essentially taking a slice to this distribution aligned with one of the axes. So we've almost dealt with all of our uh, uh, preliminaries, just independent and base theorem left. Uh, independence is very simple. Uh, two variables are independent if you can take this joint distribution and you can decompose it as the product of the marginals. If you can actually get from the marginals to the joint, like you can compute, you can multiply the marginals like this and you get the joint distribution, we call the variables independent. What that basically means is uh, easiest if you rewrite it like this, if you rewrite it as a conditional. And so what it means is if you know, uh, sorry, yeah, if you know the probability of y, or if you know the value of y, sorry, then it really doesn't tell you anything about the probability of x. Knowing the value of y doesn't change the probability of x. Uh, so in that sense, they're independent. Conditional independence means that they are dependent. So knowing the value of y does tell you something about the value of x, but only because they have one common core, which is z. And once you know z, then they become independent. So once you know z, knowing something about the value of y doesn't tell you anything about the value of x. Uh, conditional independence is quite important, so I'll give you a very quick example to hopefully make it a little bit more intuitive. Let's say we have two people, Alice and Bob, and they both go to work every day and come back, and sometimes they are in time for dinner and sometimes they are late for dinner when they come back from work. And they live in completely different parts of a very large city. So they, uh, the probabilities, uh, these probabilities of one of them being on time or late for work, they are by and large independent. Knowing that uh, Alice is late for work almost never tells me anything about whether or not Bob is late for work because they don't share traffic. So if Alice is stuck in traffic, then Bob is, we don't know whether Bob is also stuck in, stuck in traffic. Uh, their lives, you know, they live so far apart that there's no connection between them in that sense, except for one possibility, which is that very occasionally 
a large monster attack the city, which happens very rarely, but if that does happen, happen then all traffic in the whole city shuts down and everybody's late for work. We believe that on any given day, we don't watch the news, we don't know everything, and somebody tells us just that Alice is late for work. And we think, does that mean that Bob is late for work? Well, they're very unconnected, we don't know. Except there's a very small chance that Alice is late for work because of this monster. So knowing that Alice is late for work very slightly increases our probability, uh, our belief that Bob is late for work as well. Because there's a very small chance that there's a monster, and in that case, Bob is late for work, uh, late for dinner as well. But it's a very small probability. Now, if we know whether or not a monster has attacked the city, then the two probabilities become independent. So once we know that a monster has attacked the city, then knowing also that Bob is late for work is equivalent to just knowing that Bob uh, that a monster has attacked the city when it comes to figuring out what the probability is that Alice is late for work. So that's called conditional independence which again comes back a few times in machine learning. It's quite important. Finally, Bayes' theorem, uh, which is sort of uh, our equivalent of E equals MC squared in terms of a single formula that is probably the most important single formula in our, uh, in our field. And it's basically the reason it's so famous is because it's an, an answer to the inversion problem, which is phrased here. But basically what you have is the inversion problem if you have a very good description of the system, so a system that you fully understand and that produces some observables. And given the state of the system, you know exactly what probability to assign to each of the observables. That's like a, a description of the universe, it's some part of the universe. If I know the state of the universe, I know what the probability of every outcome is. But that's not the way around it goes. Usually we see the observables. And what we want to know from the observables is the state of the system. We don't see. So what we want is to take this stuff that we already know, how the state of the system translates into observables, and we want to turn it around. So we want to turn around this condition of probability. We have the probability of the observables given the state of the system. We want the probability of the state of the system given the observables. That's the inversion problem. And base rule is basically it's very easy to, to derive, it looks like this. So if you want y given x, and you have x given y, and you just multiply by 2y and divide by 3x, and you get what you want. And this follows almost directly from the definition of conditional independence. Uh, sorry, from the definition of conditional probability. So if you write down the definition, first line here, of conditional probability, and you fill in this thing from slide 22 that I said was going to be so important and come, going to come back so often, you fill that in for the numerator, then you basically end up already with Bayes rule. Uh, so how does all this, uh, how do we use all this? How do we do all this? When we learn or when we do statistics, when we fit uh, functions, basically we have to kind of take this thing that I described. You have a kind of machine, some deterministic process that you have in mind. You understand that has some states and parameters, and using a little randomness and a little deterministic processing, in some way that you fully understand, it generates some observed data. And you want to apply this inversion. You observe the data, and from the data, you want to figure out what you should think the uh, parameters are. That's the basic business of statistics, the basic business of fitting a probability distribution to your data. So you're Probability distribution is the machine, as it were, like a normal distribution. This could, this could be a normal distribution. And what you want from your observables is to figure out the state of the machine. Uh, so there's different ways of doing this. Uh, the frequentist approach is to say you have, you have to have some criterion for what, given all this information, for what the best parameters are. And Probably one of the most popular ones is the maximum likelihood criteria, which is say, take this, so forget about Bayes' rule, that doesn't apply here. Take this uh, conditional uh, probability, the probability of x given the parameters, and what we want to find is the 
uh, the parameters, the settings, for which that value is maximized, which we also call the likelihood. Uh, so that's called the maximum likelihood estimation principle. Which is a frequentist of the loop. So if you have, for instance, some observations and you make, uh, so here, x1, 2, and 3, and so on, are uh, single numbers, we make the assumption that this came from a normal distribution. Then the maximum likelihood principle just says we take the probability uh, of all these numbers, of all these axes, we assume that they were independently drawn. From a normal distribution, so the this probability decomposes as the product of the uh, probability of x i under the parameters of the normal distribution, and then we just search somehow for the sigma <coughs> and uh, mu, which maximize this value, this likelihood value. That's the maximum likelihood fit for uh, for some data <coughs> under the assumption that they are normally distributed. Uh, that's not what Bayesians do, because Bayesians have a trump card. They can say, uh, they can express their beliefs as a probability. So after you've seen the data, you don't know what parameters are. You still don't know. You're still uncertain. But you have a certain belief. Your belief has become more precise after you've seen the data. So you can just say, my belief in the parameter value after I've seen the data is just the parameter of theta given the data, and I will use Bayes' theorem to invert this. So that's equal to the probability of the data given the uh, parameter, so that uh, likelihood we saw earlier, times the probability of the parameter, divided by the general probability of x. And these two distributions we call the prior and the posterior. Uh, sorry, but this is wrong. Uh, but this is the prior. And the prior signs, what I've shown here, is called the posterior. Oh, uh, no, it's right. Sorry, I'm confused. <laughs> Late in the day. Um, so this is the prior. Start there. So it's uh, basically your belief over the parameters before you've seen the day. If you think about the parameters before you've seen the day. Um, so uh, for instance, you might uh, believe that a black swan is equally likely as a white swan. And then after you've seen 200 white swans, you update your beliefs uh, into your posterior belief. So your prior belief is kind of uh, like a 50-50. Now your posterior belief assigns more probability to the white swans. Uh, so this is the prior, which we, the prior you cannot compute or you cannot calculate. You just have to somehow figure out what your beliefs are and get them into a function. And then once you've done that, you can work out the posterior using Bayes' rule, and that gives you a distribution over the parameters. So if a uh, uh, Bayesian is to fit a normal distribution, they would get a sample from the normal distribution, and they would output another probability distribution. Instead of the frequentist, it gives you, that tells you this is probably the mean, or this is a value that is probably pretty close to the mean. A Bayesian would say, this is my distribution over the space of all possible means. And that's the output of a statistical process for a Bayesian. And then as a compromise, there's something called the maxima, maximum a posteriori criterion, where you don't take the maximum of the likelihood, but you take the maximum of the likelihood times this prior, so the sort of numerator of your base uh, function, your base uh, rule. And this is like a compromise of these both parties unhappy. The frequentist is unhappy because it includes a prior, which is a distribution over a true value, over a, uh, an objectively true value. The parameters are objectively determined values, so you shouldn't define a probability over that. So that's why the frequentists are unhappy, and the basins are unhappy because it's a point estimate. So you end up with a single value for the parameter, <coughs> whereas you could also have a, you could also express your belief over this state using a probability distribution. Uh, so both people uh, uh, both purists will be unhappy, unhappy with the maximum a posteriori criterion, but it does come up a lot. It uh, does actually work very well, so the machine learning people tend to go for this kind of thing. So I'm, as usual, running a little late, but that's the basics of probability. Uh, so first of all, let's take a little breath. <coughs> 
digest that. And let's see how far we get into information theory before the break. Uh, so just to settle down a little bit, imagine, it's another hypothetical, imagine you're uh, on holiday and you're bored. But luckily you've brought your set of travel monopoly. So you're going to play some monopoly. Unfortunately, the dice are missing, which is a shame. Uh, but you do have a coin. I mean, everybody has a coin. So you can flip a coin. So you have a source of randomness. This one will give you uh, two outcomes uh, uniformly distributed instead of six outcomes uniformly distributed. So the question is, can you use the coin to uh, throw in multiple times, throw in, throw in the coin multiple times? Can you use that to simulate a die? I was going to give you some time to think about that, but we're running a little bit behind time, so I'll give you the answer. First, let's imagine, let's take these for ourselves and say, can we simulate a four-sided die? Well, let's see, you just flip the coin twice, which gives you four equally distributed outcomes, tails, 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 heads, heads, tails, and heads, heads, which we can represent by a three, like this. And you just assign every outcome of the die to one of these outcomes, which gives you a way to simulate a four-sided die. Unfortunately, that doesn't work for a six-sided die. But what you can do, let's do it uh, for a three-sided die. If you have a three-sided die, then you can also get a six-sided die, right? You just do the three-sided and you flip again to see if it's one, two, or three, or five, uh, four, or five, or six. So to get a, uh, a uniform distribution over the outcomes one, two, and three, what you do is you flip the coin twice. You assign the first, four, first three outcomes to the outcomes you're interested in. And if it's the fourth outcome, if you throw head twice, you just return it and you start throwing again. And then if you end up with another two heads, then you start throwing again and so on and so on. So in theory, you might throw forever and ever and ever, but practically, uh, after a couple of times, you are going to end up with a throw. And since every outcome is equally likely, uh, you have a uniform distribution. So that's one way to do a six-sided die, but let's go back to this. Um, let's not, let's disallow this trick of going back to the, um, to the top of the tree and think about what kind of probability distributions can we simulate without that trick. So if we draw a tree that has a single outcome per uh, leaf node of the tree, a binary tree, what kind of probability distribution can we simulate with a single coin? So here are some examples. If you want a, uh, so the tree can be infinite, inc uh, incidentally. The tree can be infinite, but every leaf has to be a unique outcome. If you want a uh, probable, uh, sorry, exponentially decaying probability distribution, you can do it like this. So you just, every time you throw heads, or with the tails. Every time you throw tails, you assign it a number. And if you throw heads, you keep going. So the probability of throwing one of the outcome one is one and two, is one half. Probability two is a quarter. Probability three is one eighth. And so on and so on. So it decays exponentially. So the probability of throwing anything larger than 20 is about one in a million. Uh, and if you want a distribution where the probability of the larger numbers are a bit higher, uh, you can arrange your tree like this. So here the probability of throwing five or something larger than five is already pretty big. All you have to do is throw two heads, and then you know that you're throwing something larger than five. So you can uh, generate quite a lot of probability, uh, describe quite a lot of probability distributions in this way. And this is called a prefix tree code, or a prefix tree. And basically, it assigns codes. Basically, if you replace heads and tails by 0 and 1, then it assigns a code to every, every leaf. Like this A has the code 0, 0. B has the code 0, 1, 0, right, and so on. And the nice thing about these codes is that um, none of these codes is the prefix of any other code, as you can see here. So no code starts with 0, 0, because 0, 0 is already taken up with the element A, which means if you want to 
uh, communicate a sequence of these outcomes, you don't need a delimiter symbol. You can just stick all the code words after each other. And the decoder, so long as the decoder has this tree, they will be able to decode this sequence. They will know exactly where each symbol starts and ends. And these prefix trees and probability distributions, they have a very, they're very close to connect. So we've already seen how to turn a prefix tree into a probability distribution by coin flipping, basically. You flip coins and you follow. You go left if you flip heads and right if you flip tails. Which means that the probability distribution, that the probability of a certain outcome with a code of length L is 2 to the power of minus Lx, which is 1 half times 1 half times 1 half. Or the other way around, <coughs> if you want to get more probability to a uh, code length, you just turn this back. So, what's this family? of probability distributions that we can describe like this. If we allow ourselves a little bit of uh, inaccuracy, how, how rich is this descriptive space, uh, space of probability distributions that we can describe this way? Well, it turns out there's an algorithm called a, uh, arithmetic coding. And it provides for any given px, any given probability distribution, it provides a prefix-free code such that the code length uh, outputted by your arithmetic coding differs from the uh, code length minus log px by less than a bit. So up to one bit, so if you're allowing one bit accuracy, inaccuracy, then any probability distribution you're interested in can be described in this way. In other words, if we do a bit of hand waving, a bit of fudging, we can equate codes with probability distributions. That's the basic principle of information theory. I have a little bit more to say, but I'll save that for after the break. So let's take a 15 minute break, and then we'll talk a little bit more about information theory, and then about how to build classifiers. Find your seat. Hopefully get back on schedule again. I hope you'll forgive me. Um, so the question already during the break, so I talked about this, um, this principle, this information theory principle, that for any given probability distribution, whether it's a normal distribution or a uh, normal distribution, there is a prefix tree that describes it, such that if we use a coin flip to follow the prefix tree, we get samples from that distribution. Up to this hand wave, you want a bit difference. So I got a question during the break already, so what, what's the point? Why is that a useful thing to have? Uh, two reasons. The first is that um, it's often quite, if you have a big space of things to describe, a big space of complicated things to describe, like big graphs or movies or uh, large sequences, like bits of language, something like that, um, it can often be very easy to describe them, uh, to, to find a way to describe them, to, to come up with a description method. And if that description method is efficient for your data, then you also get a probability distribution that is a good fit for your data. Uh, so you can exploit this kind of uh, connection between description methods and good probability distributions. It's called minimum description length, uh, field of statistics. We won't go into that. For the purposes of today's lecture, the main use is to explain what entropy is. Because entropy is a function, is a, a principle that occurs a lot, that comes back a lot in machine learning. So, Basically, the question here on this slide is, let's say we get data from some uh, probability distribution x from some source, and we encode, uh, we sample some x, and we encode it with the ideal code for x that corresponds to so the prefix tree that corresponds to p. What is our expected code length? So let's call that h of p, which is the expectation under this probability distribution p of the length of x. So if we fill in the definition of expectation, which uh, some of you practiced uh, during the first uh, homework, hopefully, that looks like this. So you get sum of all outcomes and then multiply each by probability. <coughs> and if we fill in the uh, definition of L, this code length, which is the negative logarithm of the probability of X, we get this. Note that the negative part is taken out of the sum. 
So basically what we get is the expected code length for the code corresponding to the distribution from which we sampled x is the negative of the sum over all x, the probability of x times the logarithm of the probability of x, and that's the entropy. And the entropy describes essentially how non-uniform a distribution, how uh, chaotic it is, it's often uh, equated to chaos or, or disorder, disorderedness, basically how much we know about a distribution before we've sampled something from it. We know the distribution, but we haven't sampled yet. How much do we know? If we don't know anything, then the probability, let's say we have four outcomes, and the probability is the same overall. And if you work out this uh, entropy, you see that it's two bits. Because we need two bits of information, like this prefix here, uh, with two levels, to describe which of the out if we want to communicate to somebody, if we sample from this distribution, we want to communicate to somebody what we've sampled, we will need two bits of information. And we can't do it without that. If you know something about the distribution beforehand, if it's uneven, you know more than in this case. For instance, we know that A is very likely, then the entropy goes down. So if you work out the, the entropy for this distribution, you will realize that it's 1.75 bits because we have one element at least that is more frequent, that is more likely than the other elements. So we can give that element <coughs> short code work, and our expected code length goes down. So the takeaway is entropy is a good measure of how non uniform or how uniform a distribution is. The bigger the entropy, the more uniform the distribution is. And the less you know. You can also ask, what if we um, use a different code? So we sample from P again, but we use some other code, which corresponds to some other probability distribution. Let's call that Q. What happens then? So Q is, say, our model. Uh, then the expected code length corresponds to something called the cross entropy between P and Q. So it's the expectation under P of the code <laughs> length under Q. Uh, which works out like this. And it turns out this is always bigger than or equal to the entropy of P. And it's at its minimum. It's the cross entropy is the smallest when Q is exactly equal to Q. So then we're back to the original entropy. So the minimum of this function is the entropy. And if we, uh, so the best we can do, the best expected code length we can get is from encoding our data by the uh, code that corresponds to the source of the data. And if we get it wrong, if we don't try to figure out what that is, what we pay is the difference between the entropy and the cross entropy. Which is also called the kullback leibler divergence, which is basically the cross entropy it translated so that its minimum is at zero. So if you take this cross entropy and you subtract the entropy of P, then the resulting value is uh, a distance function between P and Q, which is zero when P and Q are equal and otherwise is bigger than zero, which makes it a good distance function. Uh, and if you work it out, it's like this. That's not important at this moment. So that's all I wanted to talk about in terms of information theory. Just to summarize, we can equate these codes in probability distributions, which gives us two functions, the entropy and the cross entropy. Uh, and the uh, entropy is a good measure of the uniformity of P. And the cross entropy is a good measure of the distance between two probability distributions. So finally, that's all I want to say about information theory. So now we can talk about classification. Uh, let's set up some notation first. So we have, we think of our data set, as I said before, as a sequence of random variables. So they're all randomly sampled. So the data set X is a sequence of random variables. And each instance is, uh, uh, contains multiple people. Oh, sorry, I'm saying this wrong. Uh, well, it's still true, but it's not what I'm saying in this slide. So let's say x in this slide is one instance. So we're focusing on one instance, uh, which is a sequence of features. I think of it like a vector, but it's a uh, random variable. 
And for each feature, we have one random variable. And that's the random variable that describes our instance. And then for that instance x, let's use an example, there is a class. And that class is described by the random variable y. So really what we're talking about, and we're sticking to binary classification for the time being, so the class can take the, the random variable y can take the values pos and nec. So the positive class and the negative class. And really the distribution that we are interested in is the probability of y given x. We've seen the, uh, we've seen the data. We've seen the instance. Give us a probability distribution over the classes. Tell us what the probability is that this instance x has class pos, and tell us what the probability is that it has class neg. And since those are the only two outcomes, those two values should come to one. So that's the main thing. That's how we model uh, the idea of classification. So whatever we do, we want to end up with this kind of probability. And then if we want an actual classification, we can just pick the one with the highest probability. So how do we end up here? How do we end up with this kind of distribution? Uh, there's two ways. One is what's called a determinative classifier. We just say, well, this is a function. We just say this is a function from input x to output some probability. So we just model that as a function, like a regression or something similar to regression. So we just take this function and try and approximate it with some machine learning method. That's called uh, discriminative classification. Because all we're trying to do is discriminate instances of one class from instances of the other class. And there's a less direct approach, which is called uh, a generative classifier, where instead of approximating this value directly, we rewrite it using Bayes' rule to turn it around to get the probability of the data given the class. We model that. And then we use Bayes' rule to get this one. Uh, so we'll start there with some examples of uh, generative classifiers, which is more indirect, but it does give you uh, maybe more information, it gives you a bit more insight into your model. So sometimes it's, uh, it's the way to go. Although I think the generative approach is more, uh, sorry, the discriminative approach is more <laughs> popular these days. So we'll end up with the more popular method at the end of the lecture. But very briefly before we do that, we'll look at some uh, generative classifiers. And there's basically, basically a spectrum you can draw from the uh, very correct and very complete and optimally, uh, optimal, optimally performing way to do it, which is called the base optimal classifier, uh, which is very good and, uh, well, not just very good, under certain assumptions it's optimal. There's no other classifier that can be better. But it's kind of a theoretical construct because you cannot usually compute it. Uh, and we're not going to actually discuss it today. But it's good to know that it exists and that it's something different from a base classifier. So going down from this optimal construct that we would like to use but can't use, we have to make some assumptions. So the base classifier is a reasonable, reasonable approach for low dimensional data where we take a point estimate for uh, every class. So this other value that we're going to approximate, px given y, which we're going to model, we do this with a point estimate. So we just pick a value for the parameters of this model. We'll see later how to do that. So that's how we, uh, why it's not an optimal class, base optimal classifier. Uh, and sometimes even that's not good enough, and to simplify it even more, we make even more assumptions. We can make a, a, a conditional independence assumption, which, and, uh, which gives us a naive base classifier which is a classifier where we're pretty certain that we've made so many assumptions that it's not correct anymore, that it doesn't actually correspond to the process that generates our data. But despite that fact, it still uh, works extremely well, and it's extremely cheap. But first, let's look at this base classifier uh, in a bit more detail. So we have here this py given x that we're interested in. 
uh, which we can rewrite using base rule. And we're not usually interested in the uh, uh, the bottom part, the uh, denominator, p over x. Because if we uh, remove that, then the resulting uh, value, that p, uh, pxy, px given y times py, uh, if we compute those values, it doesn't sum to 1 anymore. But it's still, this value is still the highest for the class for which the probability is the highest. So if we look at these values, the unnormalized probabilities, we can still tell which is the most probable class, which is really the only thing we're interested in. So usually we just compute this part, which is proportional to the actual distribution that we're interested in. And then if you want a classification, all we do is just get the outmax of the classes. So we just pick a class for which this value is the highest. And in order to compute that, to do this, all we need to do is fit a model to px given y and to py. So what we do is we take our data set, we separate it into two positive and negative classes, so we get two sets of points, and we fit some probability distribution to one, and we fit some probability distribution to the other, like here. Um, think of, for instance, um, uh, multivariate normal distribution, it's really easy to fit. We estimate the y from either from some information that we have about class distributions or just from the data. And then we compute this. And that gives us a classifier. So for instance, let's say this is our data set. We get some set of points, uh, in this case a blue class and a black class. We separate out the point class and we fit into multivariate normal distribution to the clusters, which is this uh, indicated by the blue LH. And we fit a multivariate normal distribution to the circles, which is indicated by the black ellipse. And then for every any new point, we just uh, oh sorry, and I missed out the p y. So let's say p y assigns equal class with equal probability to each class, so it doesn't really factor into it. That means that just for any new point, we can just check which of these two multivariate normal distributions assigns the highest likelihood, and that's the class that we assign which gives us a decision boundary that is this red line. So from base rule, we can just work our way down to these specific uh, probability distributions that we estimate, and we fill them in, and that gives us a base classifier. Um, sometimes, so that works well for relatively low dimensional stuff, but sometimes dimensionality is very high, uh, so then you don't really have enough data to properly fit a multivariate normal distribution that high, so what you can do is you can assume conditional independence of the class. And this is usually, uh, so here's what that looks like. Remember the definition of conditional independence. And this is usually done with categoric features. So we'll switch from this numeric feature with the multivariate normal distribution to a data set with categoric features to illustrate the, uh, the principle. So let's say we have a, um, email data set with Han and Sam, and we just look at two features. Does the word fill occur in the email, or does the word meeting occur in the email? <coughs> and broadly, one feature is indicative of the Sam email, and the other feature is broadly indicative of Han email. And we're not even counting how often the words occur, we're just counting do they occur or do they not occur. So they're categoric features with just two possibilities, true or false. True if the word occurs, false if the word doesn't occur. And we can um, model these features with a uh, Bernoulli distribution, so a simple distribution of two outcomes, like a coin flip with an unfair coin. And what we want to estimate is just the probability of each feature given the class. So here, we want to estimate the probability that feature one is true given half. And we just estimate this from the relative frequencies in the data. So in our data set, there are two keys in the feature one column, and six values in total for the uh, class half. So the probability of P is two over six, and the probability of F is four over six. 
And for SAM, we look at the other examples. So we look at the SAM examples. There are five SAM examples. And feature one has two, four, three things. So the probability of that feature one is two, given that the class is span a three over five and a two over five. Uh, that the probability is uh, uh, that the feature is f. So for each feature in isolation, we fit one of these probability distributions, and then we just change this event because we have assumed that the uh, this probability distribution here of all the uh, joint probability distribution of all features that it's uh, that these features are conditionally independent. So this breaks apart. We can decompose it into just the product of all the features in isolation, which we can just fit from the data. And that gives us a classifier. And that already works very well. So you have to make the clear assumption that these features are conditionally independent, which is not normally true. Uh, but even though it's not true, it still works very well and allows you to very efficiently fit this probability distribution. Uh, with one exception, one thing uh, always goes wrong that you need to take into account, uh, which is that sometimes it's estimated probability is zero. And we have a, since we have a long product of values here, <coughs> a single zero can really screw with the result, right? If just one of these estimated probabilities is zero, then the whole thing becomes zero. That's how products work. Uh, let's look at an example here. In this case, if we look at the uh, uh, probability that feature one is true, given that the class is spam, uh, that's true for all examples we've seen. And the probability that it's, which means that our estimated probability that feature one is false becomes zero over five, which is zero. Uh, so now the, um, Oh, I have, a, I have it written out. So now the conditional probability of uh, the class spam, so Y is spam in this case, becomes zero, independent of what all the other features uh, are doing, independent of this other feature. Even though this feature might outweigh the factor. So this feature quite strongly says it's probably uh, not spam if the feature one is false, but this because this feature might outweigh that, and we're sort of taking away its opportunity to outweigh that because of the zero. Because of the zero, we're ignoring everything that happens in the second feature. So the answer to that is uh, smoothing, basically turning, tuning our estimation of these probabilities a little bit so that we never get zero. And the simplest way to do that is to add pseudo observations, which basically mean that for every uh, value of each feature you can find, uh, you add a single in, uh, n every class, you add a single instance. So we add, for the class span, we add two instances, one which adds uh, an s to every feature and one which adds a t to every feature. So we add two instances, not four. We don't have to uh, do the full product uh, multiplying out all the um, features against each other. We just need to make sure that for every feature there is at least one instance with an F and one instance with a T. And then the same for uh, half, which we've talked about this time. Um, and that ensures that the probability is never zero. <coughs> now we don't actually have to do that. We can just change our estimator, but this is in practice. Uh, practically, this is what we sort of want to achieve. And that means if we have the unsmoothed estimator, which is where the um, probability of t given spam is just the frequency of t in spam data divided by the total number of spam instances, we smooth that by taking the frequency of t in spam, uh, which we say plus one, because we're adding one instance with a t, and we're adding a d to the uh, denominate, uh, de uh, denominator where p is the number of different classes. So we say p is uh, Because we've added two pseudo observations uh, that they should be a plus one. Apologies for that. 
But that's basically smoothing. We just make sure we just add some pseudo observations to make sure that the uh, probabilities net is there. And there's a few ways to, to make this um, more practical. Usually, you want to make these observations weigh slightly less because otherwise they skew your results too much. Uh, we have a question? Uh, so the question is, uh, when you add these observations, is there a rule how to add them based on the sample size or based on the data size? Um, well, the basic principle, you just want to ensure that for every class and every uh, possible value for a feature, there is one instance that has that value. So x can take the, can take the values f and t. So we want one SAM instance that has the value f for instance, for feature x1. And we want one instance, one SAM instance that has the value t for uh, feature x1. And then we want one hat that has that feature, that has the value f, and one hat instance that has the value f, uh, that has the value t. Um, that's the basic idea, because then you can ensure that it, that the uh, this resulting ex this estimator is never zero. Um, and then the problem becomes, that these weigh a little bit too heavy. If you make it small, these instances weigh a little bit too much and they skew your results a little bit too much. So you can assign a sort of weight to them so that you essentially take them not as one instance, but as one tenth of an instance or one hundredth of an instance, um, which kind of ruins this metaphor, but it's in the estimator it just looks like putting a plus 0 0.01 here and multiplying it by 0 0.01. So it works out in the estimator, but it kind of ruins the metaphor of pseudo observations. This is the same as just replacing the zero with the zero. Um, ah, good question. Is this the same as just replacing the zero, the probability zero, with the 0 0.001? Almost. So we have this zero here. Um, so let's look at the pseudo observations first. So in that case, the question is, is it the same as just replacing this zero with a one? Yes, except that you're also replacing the five. Because you're not dividing by five anymore, you're dividing by the total, you add some pseudo observations, so you're dividing by the total. So if you replace, if you do this trick with the 0 0.1 say, then instead of uh, zero over five, you end up with 0 0.1 over, in this case, 5.2. Because the size of your data set has grown by two examples. Uh, in fact, sorry, by four examples, two for spam and two for ham. And the observed instance for this case has grown by 0 0.1. Um, well, uh, more questions you'll have to ask afterwards because I have to move on. Uh, there's also a homework exercise about this which will hopefully make things a little bit clearer. Um, so, summary so far, these were the generative classifiers. Um, yeah, we have these uh, different ways of doing classification, discriminative and generative classification. Naive base has this conditional independence uh, assumption which makes it work for big data sets, for uh, high dimensional data sets. And you have to use this Laplace smoothing to make it uh, deal with this problem of uh, encountering zeros. Uh, so that's the, this, uh, the generative classifier. Now let's look at a discriminative classifier. And here we are going to uh, talk specifically about this cross-entropy loss, this different loss function for this linear classifier that we've already seen. So to refresh your memory, we were talking about linear models, and specifically about when we train classifiers using this gradient descent uh, procedure, why accuracy is not a very good loss function. Because accuracy as a loss function looks like this. It has these uh, large regions where the loss has the same value. It doesn't give you a nice smooth 
differentiable of so to say no as well. So we need to, instead of using accuracy, we need to replace accuracy with a different function uh, that is differentiable, that is smooth, but, uh, and gives or puts the, the minimum roughly at the right place. <coughs> and one example we saw was the uh, least squares classifier, where as a simple trick we just said, we just assign Values, so we assign the red flag, the negative flag, minus one, and we assign the positive flag, plus one, and we just treat it like a regression problem. We just fit a regression line through that, and if the glasses are enough, uh, sufficiently far apart, then the place where the um, height level will cross the origin, which is our decision boundary, will probably be in between the two classes. That's not a good classifier, but it's a start. But it's a start. So another thing we could do, instead of assigning the values one and minus one, is we could assign the values one and zero, which isn't very different, and interpret those values as the probability of the positive class. So here we take some line, we take some function, which outputs some value, and we it, uh, we interpret that as a probability that this instance here has this probability of being the blue class, of being the positive class. So in that case, a line is not a very good model. But just looking at the data set for a minute, it makes sense for the data set, right? Because here we know this, these are given points, so we know that their class is positive. So the, pro the probability that they, have, they are the positive class should be one. Probability one, and we know that these are not the positive class, so the probability that they are a positive class would be zero. Now, all we need to figure out is how to fit a line through this in a way that makes sense. Uh, and what we do is we take, we stick with the linear classifier that we have, so we stick with the linear model, but we take its output, which ranges from minus infinity to positive infinity over there, and we squeeze it into the range between zero and one using something called the logistic sigmoid function, which looks like this. So there's an input between negative infinity and positive infinity, and it squeezes that input to the output between zero and one. Uh, symbolically, it looks like this. So it's just one over one plus e to the minus t. There's not a lot of intuition I can give you for why it looks like that, but that's what it does. And you can rewrite it. So, so you can also, if you rewrite like this, it's the same thing. I don't have time to show you why or how. Uh, it just is. And another good uh, property, useful property, is that if you get one minus <coughs> the um, logistic sigmoid, it's the same as taking the negative of the argument, which you can sort of see, I hope. So if you uh, imagine the uh, area under the uh, so between the, the uh, horizontal axis and the function, the area on the curve. That area, that, in fact, that, uh, that region of space has exactly the same shape as the area above the function, between the function and the line of uh, y is equal to 1. Right? So this part, if you cut out this part of the shape, it's <coughs> exactly over this part. Flip it up. Flip it up. Which is what you say here. Which is what this is. So one minus function, so if you flip the function like that, exactly the same as flipping the function. Which is a property that can come in useful when we start doing a bit of mathematics with this uh, function. Mm -hmm. But for now, let's just stick with this is the logistic sigmoid. And our model is just the linear model that we saw already. The dot product of w and x plus some bias b, except that we take the output of that function and we stick it into the logistic sigmoid, which squeezes it into this range of probability functions. So we get this. We have one feature, our uh, model for the probability of a positive, uh, seeing a positive instance now looks like this. 
Uh, so if we end up at this point here, for instance, if we end up with this model, this model tells us that for this point, the probability that that point uh, has the class positive is 50%, is one, uh, 0 0.5. So now we have a good model that gives us a kind of probabilistic classification, discriminative probabilistic classification, because we are given x, we are directly predicting the probability of uh, every class. Uh, obviously, we're just predicting the probability of positive class, but the probability of the negative class, because we only have two classes, is, is uh, one minus the probability of positive class. So now we have a good model, and all we need is a loss function to train this model, uh, which is where we come back to the cross entropy, which I told you about earlier, which is a good metric for the distance between two probability distributions. And in this case, we're going to compute the distance between DC probability, conditional probability distributions, namely what our classifier says the class should be probabilistically. So the probability that our classifier assigns to the, to the instance and the probability that our data assigns to the instance. So a little, a little uh, notation to make things easier later on. So we'll call the output of our classifier Qx. So for a particular instance, x, our classifier produces a conditional probability x, uh, so the probability on the class given c. So for some instance x, the probability given by our classifier to the positive class is 0 0.1, which we'll call Qx star. And the probability uh, given to the class negative follows from that, which one they need to sum to one. Uh, so this is the output of our classifier in probabilistic terms. And we will call the data label Px, and Px is always uh, zero for one class and uh, yeah, zero for one class and one for the other. Because the data knows what the correct class is. So Px is always zero for one of the classes. Uh, zero for one of the classes and one for the other. That's just notation. Now we can fill in the loss. And our loss function is just for every x, the cross entropy between what our classifier says and what the data says. So it's just the cross entropy between px and qx, but summed over our entire data set x. So if we expand this, this is, cross, this is just the cross entropy. Uh, so we sum, we take the expectation with respect to px the code length with respect to 2x, the sum of all the outcomes, so there are two outcomes in this case. And happily, because uh, px is always 0 or 1, one of these terms, for every x, one of these terms always is qx. If our particular x is p, then this is the one and this is a 0, so this term disappears. And if x is negative, then this is the one and this is a 0, so this term disappears. So if we split apart our data set into the positive and the negative examples, loss function is just the logarithm of qx over the positive example, uh, plus the logarithm of the qx over the negative examples. So this is our loss function, uh, which hopefully looks relatively simple. Uh, but just to give you a bit more intuition, if you go back to this um, least square plot, we could think of this in terms of these residuals, right? Our model predicts something. There's a distance between what our model predicts and what the data says, so these lines, which we call the residuals. And if we sum the squares of all these residuals, that's our least square law. But then we do something similar for the uh, cross entropy loss. Yes. Basically, what we see here is uh, our data and the, what the model predicts. So for this point here, our model predicts this probability. And our loss function tries to uh, maximize the size of these lines. So it tries to push up all the blue lines and push down all the red lines. And it does so by minimizing the negative logarithm. 
sums the negative logarithm of all these lines. It minimizes that, which maximizes the size of these lines. And what we saw with the um, least square blocks is that, we, that applying the square, the forward sum, the rigid ones, has a sort of effect on the outliers. It, it punishes outliers disproportionately. Outliers are punished more than small residuals. And something similar happens here. So if we look at the function of p versus min log p, then we see that if this p is this, the size of this bar, wherever this bar is very close to 1, the loss is very close to 0. And if this bar is very close to 0, so if we have like a, a blue point all the way over here, then the loss goes almost to infinity. So the very, very small bars are contribute a really a, a very uh, very contribute a lot to the loss. This is the equivalent of the squaring in the uh, loop square flat file. So that's how the cross entropy loss pushes us in certain directions. Now we're almost done with the math, except for the <coughs> worst part, which is that we need the gradients. If we are going to work out either where the minimum is analytically or the gradient descent, we need to work out the gradient of the loss. So brace yourself. So let's I'll do it just for the um, for the uh, parameter WI. So this is one of the parameters of this linear function, the, the number that we multiply with feature XI. And we want the derivative of the loss with respect so the first thing is to fill in the loss. So this is just the loss function that we saw earlier. And we can take the derivative inside the sum. We already cleaned things up a little bit. So this, uh, using sum rule, we take the derivative inside the sum. So we end up with these little terms like these. And we'll look first. We won't do the whole thing, but we'll just look at how to take this derivative. And the other things will uh, follow in much the same way. <coughs> so how do we take the derivative of qx of p over wi? Well, first we fill in the definition of qx p, which is this, what our model says, this linear model says, <coughs> push through this logarithm of the one. So we're just filling in the definition of qx p. And here's where it gets tricky. We apply the chain rule. Well, I mean, it doesn't get tricky, but it gets Visually impressive, let's say like that. Uh, oh no, not, not even general yet. First, we uh, just fill in the sigmoid function. Uh, so that looks like this. So this uh, 1 divided by we can also express as to the power of minus 1, which is useful because if you put a power to the power of something inside a logarithm, you get that thing out. So this becomes to the power of minus 1, and this ends up outside of the logarithm and becomes minus 1 in front of this uh, logarithm thing. So we just end up with the denominator inside the logarithm. Already clears things up a little bit. So now we need to get rid of this logarithm because we're working our way into this w, where the wi is lived. So we need to get rid of this logarithm, which we do by the chain rule. So we take the derivative of this logarithm with respect to this argument on the left here times the argument with respect to wi. Uh, the logarithm, the derivative of the logarithm is So that's what's happening here. We get a here first. We get a little constant, one over ln two, and then one over this argument. Um, I have to do a little hand waving here. We don't like this constant, so we can do two things to get rid of it. Well, we can say one thing. So this becomes a constant multiplier of the gradient, and we're going to multiply the gradient by the learning rate anyway. So if we're doing gradient descent, we can just forget about constant multipliers of the gradient. So technically, this is part of the gradient, but we can just forget it. Or instead of taking the um, defining the, the entropy in terms of the binary logarithm, as we've done before, we can define it in terms of the natural logarithm, which also gets rid of this constant. Uh, 
So a little hand waving, I'm just going to forget that this is here. And on the right, what we've done is we have uh, taken this plus one because it's, that just disappears to take the derivative. So now on the right, we have to get rid of this x. So we apply the chain rule again. So we get the derivative of the exponent times its argument times the derivative of the argument times on the uh, of w1. And famously, the derivative of the exponent function is just the exponent function. It's its own derivative. Uh, that's more or less how it's defined. And here, finally, we are getting to this wi. So this whole thing, the only term inside of this thing that has anything to do with wi is uh, xi times wi. So this whole thing becomes xi. This thing, uh, so this thing is uh, it's minus xi, which is minus wx. Uh, this whole thing is just the exponent here, which is its own derivative. So this just becomes the exponent of our model, which we stuck on top of the division here. And now this whole thing, it turns out we can rewrite if you look back to the definitions of the uh, sigmoid function earlier, this whole thing is just 1 minus the sigmoid function. So suddenly everything starts collapsing again. And 1 minus the sigmoid function, uh, the minus ix function here, works out as the probability that our class is negative. <coughs> so I won't blame you if you didn't follow along entirely. But what I want you to take away, at the very least, from this is that we started out with this. Oh, this didn't animate. We did a lot of very visually impressive stuff. It looked very difficult. But we ended up with this. And the reason that, we, that it all collapses again and that it all becomes so simple again is because of this sigmoid function. The sigmoid function that has these symmetries that means that when you take the derivative, it sort of collapses and cancels itself out. That's why the sigmoid function is so, uh, people like the sigmoid function so much, and it comes back so often in machine learning. Um, oh, I'm out of time, so I'll run towards here. So that's the derivative. Fill it in in the loss function, fill it in into the previous slide. This is what we get for the derivative of the wi. So now we can start doing gradient descent uh, and see what this model looks like. So I, I hope I, uh, you don't mind if I go two minutes over time just to show you what this logistic regression actually looks like on a data set. Which is like this. So this is what you get if you apply it. You get a sort of linear wavefront of probabilities. And um, what I wanted to show you was just a particular failure case of this least squares loss. So if we look at this data set, we have, to, we have a slightly weirdly distributed blue uh, point cloud. And if I want to fit a least squares linear classifier to this, what you see is that this, because these points are so far away from the residual, uh, so far away from the decision boundary, to minimize the residuals, the hyperplane is pulled towards that side. So the optimal hyperplane, even though they're perfectly linearly separable, the hyperplane is pulled towards these outliers at the top. Or to show it in two dimensions, we have some points very far from the decision boundary, from the ideal decision boundary, and it has to minimize these residuals, so it has to put the hyperplane further to those points, which means the point where it ends up crossing the axis, which is our decision boundary, uh, ends up very far to the right. And that's a problem that we don't have with the logistic, sig uh, with the logistic sig sigmoid, or logistic regression, because it has no problem taking this shape. And anything that's far away from the decision boundary but on the right side of the decision boundary, it doesn't really have to worry about. This is why the residuals matter. So when we fit a logistic regression to this data set, we get a, a beautiful linear uh, separation, which looks like this in formulated terms. So this is the area that gets high probability for the positive class, and this is the area high probability for the negative class. And there's one more artifact that I want to show you, which is that there are multiple good solutions. 
if this region of, of uncertainty, this wide region where it's not quite certain, is very small, then there's really no reason to prefer this line over this line, because both these lines give the blue points probability, give all the blue points probability very, very close to one, and all the red points probability very, very close to zero. So here we sort of don't know what to do. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next lecture when we're going to see the final loss function, which is called SVM loss. So here's a summary which you can look at in your own time and a summary of everything we talked about. So thank you for attending. Apologies for going over time and I will see you all.